Good morning and welcome back to the channel. Today we are headed to the garden. We have some harvesting to do. We poured ourselves a nice jar of sun tea that we made yesterday. It's got a whole bunch of flowers and herbs from the garden, things like that. So it looks, looks really tasty. I'm excited about that. It's a nice hot day and we've got to get started. Okay, our first stop is the water tank because I have to fill up a lot of these buckets for all of our harvest. I like to soak everything in cold water when we harvest it. That helps it stay fresher longer. It's been really warm, so I've actually been opening up our high tunnel door and we'll turn on the fan sometimes. We've been creeping up to the 80s. To Recently. So we're headed all the way to the back. Everything looks pretty good in here so far this year. We've been really lucky with the heat. This is our basil bed and I have failed to keep up with it. I should have already pruned these, but I'm to do it today and we are making a huge batch of pesto. A lot of basil out here. Probably should have done this like two weeks ago. So you don't want to see any flowers ever. <laughs> what you should do is come in here a lot sooner than I did and nip them back before that. And I just go down the, the stems until I see a set of leaves that doesn't have a flower. So sometimes you're going further into the plant. Sometimes it's just right there, but you want to catch them early and that'll keep your basil nice and bushy. Give you all the leaves you want. What we're doing by doing this is causing the plant to kind of like redirect its energy back into leaf making and not flower making, which it's trying to do. If you, I mean like if you have to go back way far, I would, and really it should just be done sooner than later and your plant will actually get really big and bushy. I think it's safe to say we've got enough. This is a bunch of basil. So they look pretty good. We're gonna head outside. We don't have any more harvesting to do in here. The first row in the garden is the main one we've been harvesting from because it is the first one that is ready for us to eat from. So we've got all our lettuces, our mustards. The mustards and the Asian greens only last like a period of three weeks before they bolt. And we just like eat them like crazy. So we will have a lot of stir fries, things like that. And then I let them bolt and they, well, I don't let them bolt, they bolt naturally, but I leave them in the garden because the honeybees absolutely love them. They don't do a lot of their foraging here on our own garden, but they do some and it's always just a pleasure to have them in here buzzing around. We're gonna harvest some greens for a salad later today and then I have a little bit more to harvest for our pesto. If it isn't already obvious, I like a lot of color in the garden. So I have all different types of lettuces here. We have like butterheads, loose leaf, romaine, but I have been eyeballing this beauty for a while and she is in her prime. So that's gonna be the one we're taking. This year, the pak choy actually held a lot longer than the bok choy. So this is what we're eating. taking all of our spinach down because the chickens like the greens once the plants start bolting and the bees don't actually go for the little flowers that they put off. So I'm just gonna harvest the leaves that I can off of them. We've already been harvesting a lot. It's amazing what plants do when they go through this process because you'll have like these huge leaves and you can still eat them when they bolt, but as it continues that process, the leaves will actually like shrink and put that energy into a different part of the plant. I think it's kind of weird, 
honestly how they can be like that and then change, actually shrink down their leaf size. This is Sorel and it comes back every year. It has like a sour lemony flavor. It is flowering already, so I'm just trying to get some leaves from it. Swiss chard looks good, so do the weeds. And I'm just gonna harvest some radishes for a salad too. Oh, I see a big one right here. Okay, that was not big. <laughs> nice big one. Got lucky with our radishes. These ones germinated really quick and fast. That's the only way to get them big. Otherwise they are going to bolt. I'm on to harvesting our herbs and cilantro is one of them I have to get. This stuff bolts so quick that I actually have to freeze it now for when it's salsa time, which won't be like months from now. So I'm gonna get a whole bunch of it. Looks awesome. I've already been nibbling off of it. While we're out here, I'm grabbing some fireweed for a vinegar infusion that we're doing. And I forgot I want to grab a banana pepper from the high tunnel. So the peppers are looking awesome so far this year. I'm really glad we planted those extra ones. And we already have a lot of tomatoes starting too. They're pretty big, very exciting stuff. Got what I needed. We've even got cucumbers ready, or I guess growing. They should be ready soon. And there's a lot of tomatoes, but these ones are the biggest so far. I think this is a bush variety. See how big some of them are? I mean, he doesn't have that many, but. Last thing we're harvesting is some chives. This is our one chive plant, and I'm gonna take down about half of it or two thirds because I don't actually really want it to flower. I want it to grow greens instead. Well, that's tricky. There we go. Basically trimming it like a chia plant Chives are the one plant here that actually reliably grows back and I mean it's prolific so it'll just shoot up new leaves in like a, just a few weeks here. I'm going to sort through those inside the house. You got to make the most of the season here. It's short, it's quick, it's fast so we've got to harvest things and get things done. We've got quite the harvest here. We are going to head inside with all of it. The first thing I'm starting on is our pesto and I'm just lightly processing our basil. I'm just kind of mainly getting rid of the stem. It's all gonna go in the blender so it really doesn't matter if a few flowers make it in there and we're gonna have a lot of pesto because this is a lot of basil, which is awesome. When we make pesto, it is different every time. I just call it pesto, but honestly, it is just some of the ingredients in pesto and then it's really just a mixture of what we have on hand. So I'm gonna start with a massive handful of basil. It's gonna take us several rounds to make all of this. And then I'm gonna add a bunch of olive oil. That's a main ingredient. You usually need a lot of that. The other main ingredient is usually pine nuts, but we are going to use sunflower seeds today and walnuts work well too. And I've got some garlic we're adding in there. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper, and then I'm gonna add some cayenne pepper too. We like it a little bit spicy. And then I have some cilantro and chives that I'm adding in here. And we're gonna top it with a little bit of white wine vinegar. You can use any vinegar. I'll probably have to add more olive oil. We usually like our pesto really thick and creamy, so not super oily. Other greens I'm gonna add is just a little bit of arugula, that spinach we picked earlier, and the sorrel. I like lemon in our pesto, but I don't have any and that has that sort of aroma. So we're gonna add that in there. All 
right? So this batch is actually a little bit more liquidy than I would have hoped for, but each one's gonna be a little bit different and then we're gonna mix it all again together. And I did forget Parmesan cheese. That's another very important ingredient for pesto. We're gonna end up with 12 amazing jars of pesto. I'm getting kind of like a Parmesan cheese and cilantro aroma going on here. I don't know of a way to safely process this. I'm sure there's a way. It just has a lot of olive oil, so we freeze it. And that works out fine for us because it's not really gonna take up that much space. On to our herb butter, which is very simple. It is literally just herbs and butter mixed together. And then we put it in a little jar and we freeze it. So we're gonna do three different kind of mixtures with different herbs that we harvested. We got this idea from like a farm CSA that we used to go to and they had a recipe called basil butter, which was literally just butter and basil. But we love herbs, so we decided to make these mixtures. And honestly, it's just awesome. Just flavored butter. This isn't anything complex. We're just using two sticks of butter for each mixture. And that's equivalent to one cup. In this first mixture, I am doing chives and parsley. Got my handy one arm little mixer here. Unfortunately, that didn't do the job. So we're just gonna hand mix it. There you go, we ended up with just over four jars. This stuff is amazing. So just when you're like cooking, you can take out a little scrape of this and put it in whatever you're cooking. This one is dill and basil. We had the parsley and chives, and then I keep the woodsy herb separate. So that's oregano, thyme, and sage. Okay, it's infusion time. This is another very simple thing. It is literally just taking some plants and mixing it with vinegar. My vinegar of preference is white wine vinegar. I'm a huge fan of it. And what happens is you let that stuff sit for a while, usually a few weeks, and it will actually infuse the vinegar with some of the aromas and flavors of the plants and herbs that you chose. Today, we're gonna be using some of those chive blossoms that we picked earlier. And I'm gonna have to get all of this in this little funny bottle here. I'm also throwing some clover blossoms in there. And it's salad season, so that's why Eric and I are making this because we eat salads pretty much every day and we usually put vinegar in our salad dressing. So this is a nice touch to that. We've made these a few times and we like to put something that has a stronger flavor, like the banana peppers, or if you're using onions, the chives will do that too. If you just use like lighter smelling things, then it won't actually have that much of an aroma. And once this is finished, you can use it however you want. You can cook with it and make other salad dressings, you know, for pasta salad, grains, other things like that. We primarily use it for our salads though. We're gonna add a few seeds of coriander. And lastly, we just need our white wine vinegar. And I believe this bottle takes two. That looks beautiful. We're gonna let this sit on the back counter for about two weeks. You can definitely let it go longer than that before you strain it, or you don't even have to strain it. You can just kind of pour out of it and keep adding some stuff to it. This is another example of one we've started. It's shallots and dandelion flowers. So. This one's only been going for about a week. We're gonna let that go a little bit longer too. Eric and I are having a salad for lunch and every time we make one, we have to whip up fresh dressing. So that is what we are doing now. We have a little bit of a mayonnaise base started. So it's one egg, the full yolk and the white. And then I have probably about half a cup, maybe a little more of olive oil. We like to use olive oil. I'm gonna use an immersion blender and get it mixed up. <laughs> Ah, 
there you go. That's as simple as that to make your own mayonnaise. A lot of people use vegetable oil. We like the way olive oil tastes, so that is why we use that. We're gonna head back over here, add our other ingredients. I really like to have mayonnaise in my dressing. Sometimes Eric will make like an Asian inspired dressing so it doesn't have mayonnaise. I always use a vinegar. That can be apple cider vinegar, normal vinegar. You can use white wine. We have red wine today. <laughs> I'm gonna add a little bit of balsamic too. And of course, salt and pepper. Sometimes we'll add some fresh herbs and then we have a little bit of celery seed and honey we're mixing in there too. Dressing does not need to be that complex at all. You can put whatever you want in it. Cilantro is actually amazing in dressing. I have some behind me, so maybe I'll add some of that. Oh my gosh, that's already the perfect consistency for our salad. That's all I had to do today. So we are going to get our jars outside and enjoy our salad. Last week, we came back from the cabin with a bunch of pike. We filleted it and these nice looking fillets, bones still in there and everything. We froze it for a few days. We thawed it out. Now I'm slicing it up. And what we are doing is we are making pickled fish. We're using pike. We actually made this two years ago. I didn't know how it was gonna turn out. Sounds kind of weird, but I assure you this is delicious. We're gonna slice it up into these little tiny chunks. I got a bunch more to do, and then we're gonna put a little bit of salt on it and pour some of the moisture out. Okay, let's get the brine going for our pickled pike. It is a pickle brine. So we're doing vinegar with water. We're gonna do three parts of vinegar. We have white distilled vinegar to one part water. We're gonna get it simmering on this little skillet here. Okay, I had to get out a second saucepan here. We have a total of six cups of vinegar and two cups of water. You can do this however you want. We're gonna do it how we usually do, like a pickle. So we're gonna do black peppercorns, coriander, we're gonna put some celery seed and a little sugar and salt. Lots of different things you could put in pickled fish. We're gonna do kind of like a citrus mix. So we got lemon, an orange, two limes. We're gonna do a few shallots in there. And then Errol just picked me a bunch of dill from the garden. Now the fun part, we get a layer, all of our pike in here, which I just rinsed all the salt off of it. We brined it for about a half an hour. We're gonna do layers of the pike. We got the orange in there, the lemon, the lime, dill, the shallot, and we're gonna keep going all the way to the top. And then as soon as our brine cools down, we're gonna pour that over the top. Well, clearly I made way too much brine. I got a few cups left over I'll have to use for something else, but that is it. That is the pickled pike. You're gonna wanna store this in a refrigerator or a really cool dark place. You're gonna wanna let it sit for about two to three weeks before you enjoy it. I mentioned earlier that there's bones in this fish. That is okay. The vinegar is gonna work at this pike. It's gonna dissolve the bones and it's gonna firm up the fish. It's gonna go from a raw looking fish to a nice piece of white meat. So we're gonna stick this in the fridge. In a few weeks, we'll give it a try.
We're collecting eggs and we have 11 today. I think they're still gonna lay a little bit more. We are at the end of June and we have started preserving our eggs for this winter. We're gonna head inside and get these taken care of. Last year we tried something new to us and that is liming eggs as a way to preserve them. We did a video where we tried them and kind of gave our opinion on them, how it worked out. There was a few things that we learned. We had two five gallon buckets. One ended up being pretty much perfect and the other one, not so much. Only half of them were usable in that five gallon bucket. That's what we're doing today. And that is something I have already been working on with these eggs recently. So we have calcium hydroxide. You can also use pickling lime or slake lime. Those are all the same things if you're going to be liming your eggs. There's also something called water glassing, which is similar, but you use sodium silicate and I have not tried that method. We we're pretty pleased with this one and that is why we are doing it this way again. So we're going to show you the process. This is a bin that I have already started on and I think there's probably like probably 30 eggs in there or so. So you have to use fresh eggs or you want to use fresh eggs. I use day old eggs or I guess fresh eggs from that day. So I try not to use anything older than that. You wanna use clean eggs. So if they're not clean, you don't wanna rub them or clean them off or anything like that. You would just wanna set those aside and eat them. So thankfully these are all very clean. And this one is important. You want to use eggs that are strong. So I made that mistake last year. I was not able to source oyster shell for our chickens. So some of their eggs were a little bit thinner. They weren't as strong as usual. This year we have oyster shell and they're very thick. And I just make sure that they're thick eggs that I'm using when I go ahead and lime them. This is another example that I have of eggs that are being limed or preserved that way. And you can see that the calcium hydroxide actually settles on the bottom. That's what you want. These eggs, by the way, will stay good for a year. So ours were, I believe they were closer to eight months old when we tried them and we used them all winter. They really do last a year. Changes in consistency a little bit, so it's not the exact same as a fresh egg, but still pretty awesome. So we're gonna add these new eggs to this batch and we're gonna measure up some of the calcium hydroxide. I have clean hands, so I'm just going to be putting them into the bucket and I can check each one, you know, to make sure there's no cracks or anything like that. Sometimes I do get an egg from our Icelandics that looks a little bit like transparent or the pores look a little funny. So I usually actually set those ones aside. I think they're a little bit thinner and we don't want them to crack. Inevitably, some of the eggs are probably going to crack because we are using such a big container. So they do get heavy by the time you're at the top. But if just a few of them crack and your measurements are right, that's really not a problem. We want our eggs to be fully submerged in that solution. So we're going to weigh out a little bit more of this and it is a ratio of one ounce of calcium hydroxide to one quart of water. And I emphasize that you probably want to weigh it out. Last time I got a little lazy and I believe with how many eggs we had crack and my lack of good measuring is what ended up making half of that batch not really turn out that right. So get out a little scale if you have one. Now it's definitely okay if you err on the side of a little bit higher. The best way I could say if you're not gonna measure is two heaping tablespoons. But again, that really depends on how you're scooping, how dense it is. And I found that out the hard way last time. So it's a good habit to measure it. We've gotta get four cups of slightly warm water so that can start to dissolve. It's a little bit dusty, it's a little bit messy, but that's okay. We've got most of it dissolved and I'm not that horribly worried if it doesn't all dissolve in there. And what we're going to do is literally just pour this right on top of our eggs. So that's it. You just wanna make sure those eggs stay submerged and you can keep topping them off until you get to you know a level where you wanna call it quits. We keep these in a cupboard that stays fairly cool. So if you have like a colder, darker area, that is a better area to keep them. They will last longer that way. We're moving on to rose petal jam. I am very excited for this. I wanted to try this last year, but 
we're going ahead and trying it this year. We have made rose syrup, rose jelly, but never have I included the petals. And I saw a recipe that did that. So I'm looking forward to this batch that we're gonna make. This is actually a little bit of a mixture of rose petals and fireweed petals because the fireweed's going a little bit early and the rose petals were just right at the tail end. So we barely got enough for this. Rose petals have a very romantic connotation and that carries through with products that you make with them. They smell very floral. They're the wild rose petals too, so they're a little bit stronger than if you were to get something from your garden. But the fireweed actually tastes a lot more like a Jolly Rancher, so a little more candy-ish. So I think this should be a pretty good combo. This is a very straightforward recipe. We're going to add, it's not even quite four cups, but they're really loose in there. I'm gonna add that to our Le Creuset here. And then I have four cups of water. So I wanna cover everything. I'm gonna see if that's enough. I think it will be. We're gonna be simmering this just for a little bit, probably like 20 minutes or so, and then we're gonna be straining all of the petals out of there. All right, our petals are about exhausted, so we're gonna strain that out. I'm gonna get this cleaned up and we're gonna be adding the liquid back to this. And that's already a really pretty color, like a light, light pale pink color. And this is the part where it becomes jam because we saved about a cup of the loose leaf, the little petals. So I'm just adding the rose petals back to the mixture. And these ones have not been cooked down. I'm gonna get this turned back on. And we are adding two and a half cups of sugar to this recipe. I'm only adding two cups right now. The rest we have set aside with our pectin. This next part is really cool. Once this sugar dissolves, we're going to be adding lemon juice and the lemon will actually revitalize those rose petals. When you cook them down, they lose their color so they don't look as appetizing. But once you add the lemon, it's really cool. They actually brighten back up. It's time to add our lemon juice. We've got about a quarter cup to add. Mm -hmm. That is so neat. It just totally popped, brightened back up. Now you could add a lot more rose petals if you want. That would be more like true jam. I just did this more for show. So I didn't actually want mouthfuls of rose petals in my jam. We've already got our jars heating up back in our water bath canner and we're gonna add the last of the sugar. So I've got a half cup of sugar and a half cup of pectin. We're using just sure gel, the no sugar or less sugar kind. Right, I think we are ready to jar this up. We let this go for about five minutes on a simmer and then probably close to two on an actual like full on boil and it's thickening up. So we're ready to get it in these jars. Look at that color. The color turned out amazing. It's definitely the fireweed that contributed a little bit to that. So we have four jars, half pints, and then we have almost a fifth one. We're gonna be putting that in the fridge, of course, after we process them. We have to process them for 15 minutes in our water bath canner. There you have it. These are all done and they look incredible. I'm very excited to try those on some peanut butter and jelly. We hope you enjoyed this video today. We're gonna to be doing a lot more gardening and canning coming up.